put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Have your plans to succeed been delayed? They say the road to success is always under construction. Follow us as we walk through Egypt. Moses had the same experience. See how God leads us. Every time I visit the tomb of Tut Moses III, I think of the marvelous way in which God delivers people. This Pharaoh wanted to destroy the people of God, but in the end, he destroyed himself. And now we come to the next one. History calls him Amenhotep II. The record tells us that he became co-ruler of Egypt with his father in 1453 BC. He was crowned as the sole ruler of Egypt in June 1450, after his father died in the Red Sea. Let me tell you the story as we enter his tomb. During the time of the Exodus, he was suppressing a revolt in Saro Palestine and only returned to Egypt in June of 1450 BC. Can you still remember when the Exodus took place? March 17, 1450 BC. Tell me, what did he find on his return? Well, all the Hebrew slaves who built the beautiful temples and palaces were gone. And what happened to his mighty co-ruler and father? Well, he drowned in the Red Sea. But the greatest shock that awaited Amenhotep II on his return was the discovery that his firstborn son died during the tenth plague. Keep this in mind. In a few minutes, we're going to see what lie his second oldest son told to explain why he became the next pharaoh. As I stood next to the sarcophagus, I thought of how he must have felt. Distraught, bitter, hurting. I've discovered through the years that if we do not manage hurt, it can easily turn into hatred and bitterness. Most bitter people started out as hurting people. And this is exactly what happened to him. On his arrival at Memphis, he was so bitter that he decapitated the few Semitic prisoners he brought from Saro Palestine. And then he displayed their heads on the walls of Karnak. When I looked at his mummy, next to that of his father, I thought how easy it is to change from hurt to aggression. The Bible says the only therapy for hurt is to forgive. Ephesians 4.32 Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ in God forgave you. The route on which God led Israel to Canaan after leaving Egypt was a long and difficult one. At the oasis of Mara, the water was so bitter they couldn't drink of it. I had some actors performing the act of tasting bitter water. So what did God do? He graciously healed the water by placing wood in it. He was trying to teach them to depend on Him for changing the bitter experiences into something sweet. When we bring the cross of Calvary into our bitter experiences, we too will become sweet. Exodus 13.17 gives another reason why he took them on the difficult road. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter, for God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. Archaeology tells us that at the very same time the Israelites would be heading north, Amenhotep II, with the larger section of the Egyptian army, would be heading south. God was looking from above, and He led His people on a detour through the Sinai Desert to the Promised Land. He saved them from a confrontation. You may be on one of life's difficult detours right now, May I assure you that a loving shepherd has your ultimate prosperity in mind and he wants to lead you to eternal fountains of joy. Trust his leading in your life. Between the legs of the Sphinx is a stela. During our next presentation, I'm going to read it to you. It is a message from the god Harmakis to Tatmoses IV. 
the second oldest son of Amenhotep II. You cannot afford to miss the next lecture. You're going to see how the greatest lie in Egyptian history actually conveyed the greatest truth in Egyptian history. God bless. See you again. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. We are now going to talk about Earth's final warning. This message we find in Revelation chapter 14. And who are the messengers and what is the message? Well, it is embodied in what the Bible calls the three angels' messages. Now, the angels are the messengers. Now, are they literal angels or are they a message that goes out into the world? We find this message in Revelation chapter 14, and of course it is human beings that deliver this message to mankind. And this constitutes the very final warning that will go out to all of humanity before the coming of Christ. The first angel's message. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of water. Whew, this is a very, very full message. So here is the everlasting gospel that has to go to the whole world. Not a half a gospel, not a three-quarter gospel. The complete gospel has to go to every nation, kindred, tongue and people. Worship is central to the first angel's message. People have to be pointed again to the worship of God. And we are told to worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. Fascinating. Let's backtrack and read this again. So we see in the first part, of this universal message, the everlasting gospel, the complete gospel that must go to all the earth. We see that it goes to every nation, kindred, tongue and people. That means it is a universal message. It is not a centralized message. It calls people to fear God, not be afraid of him, but to reverence him. And to give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. So it calls attention to the time in which we live, judgment hour. And it asks people to worship him that made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. That's the seal of God. Where do we find it? We find it in the heart of the Sabbath commandment. So the everlasting gospel is the gospel of salvation free gift of salvation in Jesus Christ, saved by grace and brought back into conformity to the will of God, obedience to his commandments. Worship him who made the creator God, not evolution, but the creator God. Give full glory to him and reverence him as is fit. So the message is a universal message. It is the everlasting gospel. It contains the seal of God, which we find in the heart of the Ten Commandments in the Sabbath. It calls to worship God as creator and it proclaims the hour of judgment. There are not many denominations that could qualify for this. The seven annual Jewish feasts in type and antitype. Let's have a look at these and see where we can fit these into the stream of time. A type is always smaller than the anti-type. It points to a greater reality. Now the Passover was held on Nisan 14. And here the lamb, the one without blemish, was slaughtered. Not a bone was broken. It pointed to Jesus Christ. It pointed to the crucifixion. It was on the Passover that Jesus was crucified. 
so it is fulfilled in Christ. The second feast was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Nisan 15, just the next day. And unleavened bread, Christ the body, the body of Christ, the one without sin, without leaven that was broken for us, Christ lying in the grave, resting in the grave, is the antitype of that feast. And then the Feast of First Fruits, Nisan 16, three days in a row, represents the resurrection when the graves were opened and uh, the captives came forth. And when he went to heaven, he led captives in his train. So these have all been fulfilled with the death and crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But there were other feasts which were fascinating. The Feast of Weeks, Sivan 6, the antitype is in Pentecost. At first the law was given in type, now the means to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and him as lawmaker was given through the power of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. So we have a fulfillment in type and anti-type. Now there remain three feasts. The Feast of Trumpets. Now the trumpet always heralded judgment. So the anti-type is the heralding of the message of judgment. We are living in judgment time. The Second Advent movement has as its message Worship God and give glory to Him. The hour of His judgment has come. So this is fulfilled in the Advent message that goes out to the world, heralding the time of judgment. The Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement was a day of judgment. It was a time of making right with God. It was the cleansing of the typical sanctuary and it prefigured the cleansing of the anti-typical sanctuary. The pre-advent judgment, we are living in judgment time. This is the message that is going into the world right now. And the question is, what does it all entail? The Feast of Tabernacles will be the final event, homegoing. It represents the coming of Christ, the new world, where we shall enter. Now the Day of Atonement, the annual cleansing of the earthly sanctuary, was a typical event which is prefiguring something that happens at the close of time. There will be a people that live as those lived in the typical Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement was a day of judgment. It was a time when you made right with God. If you didn't partake in this, you were cut off. If we do not make right with God, we will be cut off too. So, fascinatingly, the gospel in its fullness is the story of redemption from the fall through to the final reconstruction of that which it entails. It is a full message. It entails grace and it entails obedience, justice and mercy. Both of them combined. You cannot separate the one. You have to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. You have to accept Him also as your King and your lawgiver. What is the standard of judgment? When the time of judgment comes, James 1.25, But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth then, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. In other words, a time when we come back into alignment with God's law. And we have to ask ourselves the question, which church preaches that we have to come back to God's law. We have to ask ourselves, what is the fullness of the everlasting gospel? James 2.12 So speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. We cannot separate the law from Jesus Christ's grace. That would be separating his character from himself. An impossibility. 
So what is sin? Whoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is transgression of the law. 1 John 3 verse 4. That is the only definition of sin that we have in the scripture. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. Romans 4 15. So if we say we are under grace and we are not under law, well if there is no law, and if the law has been done away with, then there is no transgression, then there is no need for grace. You cannot separate the two. The everlasting gospel comprises all the aspects of the gospel. It is not a half gospel. The Jews were satisfied to keep the law, but they crucified Christ. That is a one-legged gospel. The world today is prepared to accept Christ, but they crucify the law. That is a one-legged gospel. We need both. We need grace and obedience, justice and mercy, a savior and a king. The wages of sin is death. So the judgment message is, do not transgress God's law or else you will come under judgment. We have to preach the whole message. Sin separated from God, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. Isaiah 59 verse 2. We have to come back into this harmony by obedience to God. If we love him, we will keep his commandments. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6.23 Nobody is saved by keeping the law, but nobody is saved by breaking the law either. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. We are not to put the cart before the horse. We are not saved by our obedience. But God forbid that we should be disobedient because we experience grace. This is what Paul is saying. So the everlasting gospel places it back into the right mold, into the right perspective. And the confusion of what is valid and what is not valid is laid aside. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law tells me what sin is and steers me in the right direction. The one who sustains me and upholds me is Christ by his grace. Do we then make void the law through this faith? God forbid we establish the law, Romans 3.31. We have to lift up the law and grace as equal partners in the gospel. When we look at the sanctuary, you will remember that the mercy seat and the, the grill on which the sacrifice was offered, the one depicting grace, the other one depicting justice, were at exactly the same height, one and a half cubits. God's grace and his justice come together in Christ. Do we then make void the law through this faith? God forbid we establish the law, Romans 3.31. We have to lift up the law and grace as equal partners in the gospel. When we look at the sanctuary, you will remember that the mercy seat and the, the grill on which the sacrifice was offered the one depicting grace, the other one depicting justice, were at exactly the same height, one and a half cubits. God's grace and his justice come together in Christ. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good, Romans 7, 12, we do not negate the law. If we look at the Bible as a whole, the four Gospels, in Matthew we have Christ as King. In Mark we have Christ the Servant. In Luke we have Christ the Man. In John we have Christ the Divine. So each Gospel has its own flavor. And when we preach the fullness of the everlasting Gospel, all these central issues of Christ as King, as Servant, as Man, as 
divine as being God have to be placed back in the right mold. And this, of course, is in harmony with the books of Moses. Genesis is the book of origins, the fall and the promise of redemption. It tells us who our creator is. Jesus Christ is the one who spoke everything into existence. Exodus is Christ our sanctuary. When it comes to Leviticus, Christ our sacrifice. When it comes to Numbers, Christ our guide. And when it comes to Deuteronomy, Christ our reward. In other words, the everlasting gospel is a Christ-centered gospel. But it does not leave out the necessity of obedience. Think not that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Being a universal issue and a universal gospel, the church that preaches this must also be universal. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of a pen to drop out of the law, Luke 16, 17. This is love for God, to obey his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. 1 John 5, verse 3. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, Hebrews 5, verse 9. The issue of obedience is so often overlooked these days. Grace is employed as the ultimate character of God, which is true, which is absolutely true, but not to the negation of his justice and his righteousness. So the law in the New Testament and in the Old Testament is there, it is binding, you shall worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve, is in the Old and the New Testament. That we should keep ourselves from idol is, is in the Old and the New Testament. That the name of God and his doctrine should not be blasphemed is in the Old and the New Testament. The Sabbath can be found in both. The relationship between man and man, thou shalt honor your father and your mother, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. We find them in both the Old and the New Testament. God does not change. The sanctuary message, as we discussed it, the tabernacle pitched in the midst of the people is a reflection of Jesus in the midst of his people. The door, the only way into the salvation of Christ to be surrounded by by his righteousness, the white linen representing the righteousness of Christ. All of these issues of the Old Testament and of the New Testament preach the same story. Christ being central and his sacrifice being central to my salvation. The Lamb represents Jesus Christ who was killed on my behalf. The Lamb, Jesus Christ, at the beginning of his ministry the Ram, Jesus Christ, at the end of his ministry. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world, John 1, 29. This is the essence of the everlasting gospel. My little children, these things write unto you, that you sin not, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, 1 John 2, verse 1. There is no other name under heaven and earth whereby we can be saved, except the name Christ Jesus. There are so many movements in the world today to make Jesus less than he was. He is the only divine saviour of the world. And this aspect of the everlasting gospel must be preached and brought to the fore. He was wounded for our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53, verse 5. The everlasting gospel must be Christ-centered. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. So the everlasting gospel includes the way and the means to salvation. We have to repent, said Peter. We have to be baptized. We have to 
turn from sin. When the lady was caught in adultery and brought to Jesus, Jesus said, where are your accusers? And she said, there are none left, Lord. Neither do I condemn you. He placed her under grace. And then he said, go and sin no more. He placed her under law. And so it is with us. We come to him, we are sinners, we confess, we repent. He places us under grace and he tells us, go and sin no more. So justification, sanctification are inseparable parts of the everlasting gospel. Thank God we have an advocate with the Father. So this everlasting gospel has to go to the entire world and then comes a second angel's message. And now it gets serious and sad at the same time. What is the second angel's message that must be preached to the entire world? And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, Revelation 14.8. Now, there was a typical Babylon, and typical Babylon eventually conquered Jerusalem. And the Bible said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Get out of Babylon, come out, get away from it. Because the doctrines that they were teaching were contrary to the doctrines of God. So when we read this text, there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen. We're not talking about literal Babylon that will never be rebuilt. We're talking about anti-typical Babylon. Anti-typical Babylon representing those doctrines of Babylon which have infiltrated world societies and are being preached and taught as gospel truth in these days. And this Babylon power, this is... The religious aspect of Babylon has made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This wine is false doctrine which confuses truth and error. So what is this wine of Babylon that is being preached in the world today? And who are those preaching it? We read in Second Selected Messages, this also writes, the wine of Babylon is the exalting of the false and spurious Sabbath above the Sabbath which the Lord Jehovah has blessed and sanctified for the use of man. Also it is the immortality of the soul. These kindred heresies and the rejection of the truth convert the church into Babylon. Kings, merchants, rulers and religious teachers are all in corrupt harmony. What an indictment. So the church becomes part of Babylon when it incorporates the teachings of the immortality of the soul and the worship of sun worship into its midst and preaches it as though it were biblical gospel. What a sad state of affairs. Revelation 16, 13 and 14 says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet for they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So the spiritual Babylon has three components and they work like frogs. Now, the frogs, of course, were one of the deities in Egypt and they were worshipped instead of the Creator God. Now, the dragon, the beast and the false prophet, who are these entities and what do they stand for? In contrast, we have the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. They have to have the faith of Jesus, which is more than the faith in Jesus. It is the same type of faith that linked Jesus to the Father so that he could stand the severest tests. These people, 
that are obedient and cling to everything Jesus believed will come into conflict with those that form part of Babylon. So who is this Babylon and what does it comprise? Mystic Babylon has three components. The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Well, we've really heard about all of these in the lectures thus far. The bronze frogs combined the sun with water, symbolizing fertility. They are worshipped to this day in the world. The dragon component, the Bible tells us that the dragon is Lucifer or Satan. And the dragon component thus comprises all aspects of witchcraft, spiritualism, in all its various forms. And the world is to be warned against this false system of worship and is to be informed that it is a fallen system. So when we continue in a few moments, we will look at the dragon, the beast and the false prophet component. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Put the puzzle together piece by piece and discover the whole truth. When we look at the dragon component, all the aspects of spiritualism and its various forms are embodied in it. So witchcraft would be one of the teachings of the dragon component of Babylon. The Congress of Wandering Bishops that are involved in mysticism. Any form of mysticism would fall part and parcel of that philosophy. World philosophy, one of my favorite authors in my life before Christianity was Ayn Rand. But note she says the virtues of selfishness, the Bible in contrast says there is no virtue in selfishness. So the doctrine of the power of the self, of the own power within us that lifts us up to be good, is not biblical. We have to rely on Jesus Christ. It's one of the doctrines that forms part and parcel of the wine that constitutes Babylon. When we look at the mediums and the spiritualistic performances of the world today, that's part and parcel of Babylon. The Bible says we should stay away from these mystic organizations. We should stay away from spiritism in all its forms. When people claim to be gods themselves, then they are preaching the wine of Babylon. When they preach that we, through progress, whether it be through reincarnation or any other means, can achieve godhood, then they are emulating the serpent's language which says, ye shall be as God. Well, the various movements in the world today that have divine teachers that are gods, these all form part and parcel of what the Bible calls the confusion, the wine of Babylon. So all the God-men that have appeared on the planet are emulating this teaching. The Maitreya, who is a divine being, teaching us that we are God. Or the spiritualism that we find in the stories of Harry Potter and all of these where witchcraft is embodied as a virtue all form part of the wine of Babylon. Amazingly, even churches tolerate, no, even incorporate some of these issues in their services. The birthplace of modern spiritualism, the Fox Sisters, the home of the Fox Sisters, where the wrappings first occurred, and then spiritualism teaches that we are not dead, and the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not die, in this, as in many other Bible passages, the devil told the truth and the Lord is in error. This is the teaching of the wine of Babylon. We have to preach, thus says the word. Spiritism claims that the dead are not dead. The fundamental principle of spiritism is that human beings survive bodily death. 
truth and that occasionally under conditions not yet fully understood we can communicate with those who have gone before. Arthur Hill, Spiritism, History, Phenomena and Doctrine. Wine of Babylon, the Bible says, do not be associated with this kind of thing because the deceased know nothing. They are asleep. Spiritism claims the dead communicate with the living. There is no death in the graveyard. I have frequent talks with the dead. I cannot doubt that people live after death for I frequently talk with them. Sir Oliver Lodge said that. Well, he's not talking to the dead because they know nothing and never return to this earth. Part of the wine of Babylon. The progressive thinker, May 18, 1929, what spiritism is and does, it removes all fear of death, which is really the portal to the spirit world. It teaches that death is not the cessation of life, but mere change of condition. That's what the serpent taught. Wine of Babylon. Spiritism is God's message to mortals, declaring there is no death. That was the message of the serpent, that all who have passed on still live. And there is hope in the life beyond for the most sinful that every soul will progress through the ages to heights sublime and glorious where God is love and love is God. So all the attributes that are lifted out of the Godhead are love, but justice, that is negated. Wine of Babylon. All the great mediums of our time and the prophetesses that prophesy a new age movement like Alice A. Bailey, who spoke to this entity called Dwal Kul. Or if we go to the other extreme, direct Satanism, as in the Church of Satan, which was started by Anton LaVey, who is, well, let's put it this way, the hero of many rock stars, etc., in the world today. Here again, wine of Babylon, the barrier between right and wrong, is fading Satanic Bible teaches that Satan represents indulgence instead of abstinence. Satan represents vital existence instead of spiritual pipe dreams. Satan represents undefiled wisdom instead of hypocritical self-deceit. He represents kindness to those who deserve it instead of love wasted on ingrates, etc. I don't even want to read any more of that. This is wine of Babylon. And the world has to be warned to stay away from these false doctrines. Satan represents man as just another animal, sometimes better or more often worse than those that walk on all fours, etc., etc., etc. The worship of the self, Lucifer worship directly or subtly through the spirit world, all constitute the wine of Babylon. So the dragon component is spiritism and direct sect satanic worship and that of course mankind will have to break with because if they don't they will come into the judgment now what about the beast component well we identified the beast as roman catholicism and we have to steer away from the doctrines and the false wine that emulates from this organization working towards a one world religion a new world order of religion. All things to all men, Pope John Paul II being anointed with the sign of the tilak and kissing the Quran. All religions basically preach the same thing. But they don't all accept Jesus Christ as the only means whereby we can be saved. And so how can this doctrine be reconciled with those that negate it? Wine of Babylon. We have to be careful how we worship God. Can we worship him in a host, carried around as a corpus Christi? The Bible says he was sacrificed once for all for the sin, and he's now a risen savior, not a corpse. And this constitutes the wine of Babylon. The church teaches that the Eucharist is the heart of the church. Protestant teaches that the bread is merely a symbol of the body that was broken for us. But we serve a risen Savior, not one that is still hanging on a crucifix. So the everlasting gospel replaces the wine of Babylon. People have to break with these superstitions. Or that we have another mediator, Mary, in the place of Jesus. 
or that Jesus is a mere helpless babe on her knee and she is the maternal advocate in between God and man. This constitutes the wine of Babylon. There is no other name whereby we can be saved. The dragon on the papal crest in the Vatican Museum is the same as it was in the case of Rome. Revelation 13, 4, And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? So when we acknowledge and pay homage to the dictates of this system, we are part and parcel of the wine of Babylon. And then the Bible teaches that we should beware of the teachings of the false prophet. False prophecy is false preaching. There are so many false doctrines out there. The doctrine of dispensationalism, the doctrines regarding the millennium, the doctrines regarding the immortality of the soul. All of these issues are being preached by Protestants in the world today. So we have to beware of these doctrines which make a union with the beast and the dragon, though in such subtle terms sometimes that people don't even recognize it. So who is the false prophet? Well, it is Protestantism that has adopted the Babylonian principles which they are expounding as gospel truth. I saw another beast coming up out of the earth and it had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon just like the others, Revelation 13, 11. The image is the same as the original. So out of Protestant United States will come doctrines which are contrary to what the Bible is preaching. And the liberty that we should have in God and in His law, we find is subverted into another form of liberty. A holy alliance took place between Rome and Protestant America. And the morality that will be preached in the world is Catholic morality, wine of Babylon. The wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor based on bad history, said the previous Chief Justice William Rehnquist. It was erected to prevent that which happened in the Middle Ages. It's not based on bad history, it's based on good history. Rome would bound, Protestantism going back to Rome. The Bible predicted that the children would return to Rome. Protestantism will start to look and speak just like Catholicism. Here is St. Paul's Cathedral. It never used to look like that. Today it is an image of St. Peter's in Rome. And what about the mega preachers of the world today? Are they preaching biblical doctrine or are they teaching self-esteem that we can be saved by making use of the power within and that the gospel reinforces our self-esteem the gospel is to bring us to the feet of jesus christ in repentance to be born again means that we must be changed from a negative to a positive self-image, from inferiority to self-esteem, from fear to love, from doubt to trust. And we can pray, Our Father in heaven, honorable is our name. Emphasis in the original self-esteem, the new reformation. Now, discover your possibilities. Now, isn't this part and parcel of this teaching that we can make it on our own? We can't make it on our own. We need the Savior to lift us up out of the quagmire that we are in. The fraternizing that we have between Protestantism and Catholicism, the coming together on issues of commonality, these all constitute wine of Babylon. Kenneth Copeland said, and I say this with all respect so that I don't upset you too bad, but I say it anyway, when I read in the Bible where he says, I am, I just smile and say, yes, I am too. This comes from the Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast July 9, 1987. This is fascinating. Isn't this part and parcel of what was taught there in Eden? What about all the power religions of the world? What about all of these issues? 
Don't tell me you have Jesus. You are everything he was and everything he is and ever shall be. Don't say I have. Say I am, I am, I am. The same kind of teaching. It's a spiritualistic teaching of the power of the self. It is a thread that runs through modern society, whether it comes from the mega preachers of the world, when the people fall over, when all these events take place in the churches today, it is exactly the same thing that happened under mesmerism. Is it the power of God that is doing these things while preaching at the same time that we can neglect the law, the law of God? These all constitute part and parcel of the wine of Babylon. And then there is a third angel's message that is preached in the world. Revelation 14, 9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So it warns against receiving the mark of the beast and of worshipping the system by paying it homage and obedience rather than obeying the dictates of God. The greatest warning ever given in scriptures and the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receiveth the mark of his name. No rest. Rest we find in God, and the Sabbath is the day of rest, the day when we fall on, into the arms of God and we say, "Ha, ah, here we find rest. The Sabbath is the embodiment of rest. If we accept the mark of the beast, we are going contrary to the law of God. In six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and he rested the seventh day, Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. It is immutable, it is unchangeable, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Exodus 31, 17. Nafash, he breathed, he said, ah. he found rest and we are to find rest rest in him the sign is the mark the signal the distinguishing mark so the third angel's message tells the world to go back to god to allegiance to god to obey his law in its entirety the sabbath is merely the seal of authority which is placed on the entire authority of god in other words it preaches a simple message come back into harmony with God's law, his natural law and his moral law, all of it. We have to live as though we represent the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The Bible says, remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. The Catholic Church says, no. By my divine power I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week and lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. Father Enright, American Sentinel, June 1893. That sums it up. We either worship the beast and its image that enforce this legislation or that will enforce this legislation or we worship God. That is our choice. Sunday is our mark of authority. The Sabbath is the mark of authority of God. Choose this day whom you will worship. The church is above the Bible. This transference of Sabbath's observance is proof of this fact. Catholic record. So here we have another God on earth dictating. And the world is to be warned in the three angels' messages. Not only against half-gospels, not only against false doctrines, but against false worship, worshipping a system rather than God. The sad point is that the Bible says, all the world wandered after the beast. 
Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 12. A clash is imminent. A clash between those that align themselves with the powers of Babylon and those that align themselves with the biblical injunction, the faith of Jesus, the commandments of God. These two groups will come into collision. And when they come into collision like a David against a Goliath, there will be a showdown. David has no chance, but God intervenes in the final moments. That is the biblical story of the plan of salvation. In Revelation 18 we read, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. These are powerful words. This angel comes in support of the three angels' messages where the second angel merely says that Babylon has fallen and that it has made the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of a fornication, here we have a little bit more detail. Babylon the Great is fallen, but unfortunately another spirit has taken over in Babylon. In all the components of Babylon, if they refuse, to cling to that which is written and digress into that which is spiritualistic in this triune union, then they will have to deal with the issue that devils take up their habitation and another spirit, like an unclean and hateful bird, a false Holy Spirit, will take hold of that situation. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. So the rulers, the political rulers, will rather side with these powers on earth than with the thus says the Lord. Of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. So the industrial world, the economic forums of the world will be in harmony with the system. As we have seen, some will introduce this type of legislation, the legislation regarding the mark of the beast, because of family issues and work ethics, etc. They receive the mark on the hand. Some will Delight that it be introduced because they are convinced that Sunday is the Lord's day, they will receive it on the forehead. In either case, they will be in transgression with the law of God if the law of God is negated by law in the process. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. So the three angels' messages go into the world and bring back a people from all denominations, all faiths, all societies, and call them back into harmony with God. Ephesians 5.11 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. So the message is very direct. The message lists the issues that are involved, and people must be able to make a rational choice on the basis of that. It is not a wishy-washy message. It is a message that will cut to the marrow that will distinguish right from wrong. God says, come out and be separate. Separate yourselves. 
And then there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time, Daniel 12 verse 1. After the message has gone out, the turmoil will come, the laws will be implemented, the plagues will fall. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Psalms 91 verse 1. If we choose what is right, we stand under the protection of God Almighty and the gates of hell will not prevail against God and His people because they stand on a firm foundation, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Revelation 22, 11. The decree goes out. The time of probation is over. People have heard the message. Time to make a decision. And we can stand with those that are looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearings of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, or we can throw our lot with the conglomerate of Babylon, hoping for an earthly kingdom and a millennium of peace on this planet, of which the Bible knows nothing. It only knows that the great day of His wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Jesus Christ is coming soon. And when he comes, we will have to stand on the right side of this decision. Either we are with Babylon, or we are with those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. May God give us the strength and the wisdom to make a right decision, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.